Why is the man claiming to be Charles and Camilla's love child speaking out again now? Why is everyone talking about Meghan Markle's bad judgment all of a sudden? Why this moment of bravery from Princess Anne might have passed everyone by? And what's been the most surprising reaction to the royals down under? Welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin and on my panel today is the Mail on Sunday's royal correspondent Natasha Livingston, the paper's editor at large Charlotte Griffiths and the Daily Mail's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome to you all. Now, if you haven't seen Richard discuss William and Harry's fallout in forensic detail on reading the royals, stick around to the end of the episode when it will be up next and exciting news. There will be a brand new episode next week. And reminder, if you don't already, please do join our ranks of subscribers here on the Daily Mail's Royal Channel. Click that subscribe button and never miss another episode of your favourite royal show or indeed Richard's new show. Maybe that's your new favourite show. I won't take it personally. Now, let's kick things off with the King and Queen's trip to Australia. Now, Natasha, typical of the King, he's packed a lot in. Yeah, yeah. They've been all over. Um, they started in Sydney, then they went to Canberra, back to Sydney. Now they're in Samoa. Um, and when you look at the engagements they were cramming in, he was doing up to seven a day, which, you know, for a man in his 70s who's going through cancer, I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Indeed. Now, we were promised that uh, some Republicans would be out in protest, but those protests seem to have been far outweighed by the huge crowds that have come out to support them. Yeah, I mean, um, we know uh, Graham Smith, who's from the UK's Republic movement, he flew out and kind of tried to generate some noise around it, but it didn't really get much pick up. Um, there was um, the um, a senator, um, Lydia Thorpe, who she, um, it was a very vocal, loud protest. It did get a lot of headlines. Yeah. Um, but generally, um, it, it was very much, um, she was criticised by the Australian media, and the Australian media in general have been so supportive of the trip. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's remarkable, really. At ten thousand people turned up to the Sydney Opera House, waiting in the boiling sun mm. um, to see them. So yeah, the reaction's been pretty positive. Richard, it's true, isn't it? it a lot of people were predicting some sort of massive anti-monarchy movement, but that doesn't seem to have come to pass, does it? It's funny, isn't it? I mean, people sort of predict the end of the monarchy. They think, oh no, that's something that should be consigned to the past. But when you saw those numbers turning out on a boiling hot day. You know, it's like a sort of rock star welcome in, in many ways. It was, it was quite, I think they probably would have been surprised themselves actually. There was a lot of concern before the trip about things that could go wrong and there, there was a strong feeling that a lot of Commonwealth countries sort of stuck with the Commonwealth um, and the ones where, um, you know, the Queen was head of state, they stuck with it because of her, because of Queen Elizabeth and all the respect that she had and that that would disappear when she died. And actually, to me, this, this tour has shown that that really isn't the case necessarily. It's funny that my memories of living in Australia, are that we are so aware of how far away it is that there's always an element of gratitude that people <laughs> just make the trip. And, you know, the fact that Charles is older now, he's been battling with cancer, it, it just seems like there's definitely felt like a mood that it's actually screaming abuse at him as just plain rude. I mean, remember, it is a historical trip. He is the first reigning king to visit Australia. Um, and I think the fact that he has um, been unwell, and let's be honest, he has looked very tired by the mm. end of this this trip. I think people appreciate that, know that he's made that, that big effort to come. Yeah. Do you think it will be viewed as a positive trip, Charlotte? I think definitely. He hasn't done any other big abroad trips. He really cleared his schedule for this and he said, if there's one big trip I'm going to do, it's going to be Australia. And he's gone there, he's made this Herculean effort and he said, didn't he, um, to somebody who asked, he said, I wish I could stay longer but my doctors won't let me. And he's really giving that image that he really wants to be there and he moved heaven and earth to get there and he di basically disobeyed doctor's orders because he really cares about the country. So. I think it's a real PR win for him. Mm, amazing. Well, it has been an extraordinary week for the King and Queen in Australia. Rebecca English has, of course, been out there with them. Here's her take on things. King Charles and Queen Camilla have just arrived at Sydney Airport to start on their six-day visit to Australia. And tonight, in honour of Their Majesty's visit, the iconic Sydney Opera House is being lit up by a loop of images taken from royal visits over the years. They've been really rather long days in Sydney and Canberra. I know the King had his diary tweaked before he came out to take account of his ongoing cancer battle, but you really wouldn't have known it. I think today in Sydney I've accompanied him on seven engagements alone. 
I'll be honest at times I, I do think he's looked a little tired I think the combination of the long journey and the jet lag has taken its toll on top of his ongoing cancer treatment I think that's entirely understandable in Canberra on Monday I was standing next to him as he was listening to a speech and just for a moment he closed his eye for a second and I think in that split second he looked very human and, and very vulnerable but then I was with him later at the Australian Botanical Gardens and he spotted me standing there and gave me a broad grin and kind of waggled his eyebrows to say oh here we are again so I think it depends on on what moment you catch him. Queen Camilla's been on great form too. On Monday, we had a bit of a joke about the ridiculously unsuitable footwear we were both wearing for a trip to the botanical gardens. And actually, I think she's been incredibly touched by the very warm welcome that she has received too, in addition to her husband. And that's what's been so remarkable about this trip. Yes, I mean, we did have an incident on Monday in the Australian Parliament involving the outspoken Senator Lydia Thorpe. It was unfortunate, but it was well handled and has been fairly roundly condemned here, even by people who share her views. And I think Buckingham Palace have quietly been quite relieved and actually very heartened about the warmth of the welcome and the size of the crowds, particularly given how popular Queen Elizabeth II was here and it's clear the issue of republicanism while still live and very much worthy of debate is not a matter that's massively excising Australians at the moment tomorrow it's onwards to uh, Samoa uh, for the Commonwealth heads of government meeting which is a, another very very high profile event particularly for the king because it'll be the first time he's attended that event as sovereign and head of the Commonwealth and before I sign off, I just wanted to say a huge personal thanks to the many dozens of Palace Confidential viewers who have stopped me to say hello or waved or shouted as I've been running past while I've been in Australia. It's been incredibly heartening to see how popular the programme is. Um, so thank you very much. And I've made sure I've passed on all your best wishes to Joe and Richard. Rebecca English there, and we very much look forward to her take from the Samoa trip next week. Richard, uh, we should mention at this point something that has had quite a lot of attention online, that there is a man who claims to be the son of Charles and Camilla. What can you tell us? Yeah, he has become a bit of a familiar figure over the last few years. It's um, someone called Simon Doran Day. Um, well, Simon Charles. He does have Charles as a middle name. Uh, um, what does he think the clue's in the name? <laughs> possibly. But he does claim to be... Um, a child, um, illegitimate son of Charles and Camilla. And he's been demanding DNA for a, for a long while, and he had hoped to use this visit as a chance to sort of confront them, I think. Or, or <laughs> pluck a hair for a bit of a DNA test. I should test. say, to be fair to him, not necessarily to confront them, but he hoped to use the yeah. trip to perhaps get to know his parents sort of thing. Anyway, that, that's, I think, what he had said. How did that work out? Um, I don't think it's necessarily gone as, as he had hoped. Um, but essentially... The, the palace can't be just handing out DNA, you know, I mean, where do you start? I, I think his evidence um, on the face of it does seem to be quite thin. It's to do with his adoptive grandmother, I think, who he lived with, uh -huh. or, um, and it comes through her um, line. Right. But anyway, he's got it in his oh, head. Apparently she worked for the Queen. She worked for the Queen, the Queen right. Yeah. Um, well, anyway. It is what it is, and um, he the tour has finished without him being able to meet his um, supposed parents. Gosh, Natasha, there's not really a lot that the king and queen can do about this, is there? No, I would say they're sticking to um, the phrase which they always use, which is just keep calm and carry on. Yeah, don't complain, don't explain. <laughs> yeah, uh, Don't explain that one. Charlotte, <laughs> to a very reliable royal source now, and Mike Tyndall has made more really quite sweet revelations about life with the royal family, hasn't he? Yeah, so he was very keen to point out that life in the royal family isn't Downton Abbey. They don't have these huge, grand dinners every night. I'm quite um, disappointed by that, are you? Yeah, well, he didn't actually offer an alternative. He didn't say, but by the way, we all have, you know, trays on our laps and we watch Coronation Street, which I wish he had said. But he did say that um, his, uh, he released a picture of his daughter, Mia Tyndall, with Prince Philip. And Prince Philip was just eating some picnic food. It just looked very informal. And it was really nice to get a glimpse of that informal side of, of the royal family. And watching racing with the Queen and Zara. Yes. Like uh, on TV, I can't, it's just a, 
It's quite an image, isn't it, to imagine just sitting around the box with the Queen? I kind of can imagine them watching <laughs> the races because they love racing, don't they? And they horse, love all things yeah, horses. Yeah. But yeah, the idea of... And actually, he did give us a glimpse of what it's like, you know, little grandchildren running around and just sort of asking Grandpa to pass the toast or, you know, whatever. It, it's quite nice to know. There was one thing he said which I thought was really poignant, was he said that he... He wished that he'd asked Queen Elizabeth more questions, really, because he did have the opportunity to sit next to her at some dinners. And looking back, he thinks there's so many things that, you know, with all her experience of politics and presidents and stuff that he would have liked to have asked her. But he was always nervous and yeah. always sort of, mm. you know, on his best behaviour. So but that's um, the strangest did. thing about that family, isn't it? It's like it's it's your grandmother-in-law, but she's also the Queen of England. Yeah. It's like, how do you tread that line? Yeah, I imagine he was trying to sort of play it cool. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and it's not very um, cool to start, you know, they, asking lots of difficult questions. Yeah, they really appreciate him playing it cool. That's the other really nice story that came out around his book, which is that they really appreciate him. They don't think of him as some commoner that married into the family. They they love how casual and informal he is. And apparently, you know, when there's a very formal occasion or if, if, if everything's quite serious, he just adds a real lightness of touch to everything. And they really appreciate him for that. And they clearly trust him because he went on I'm a Celebrity, which is not the sort of thing, you know, if they didn't yeah. trust yes. him to kind of be out with the public and, you know, being honest with people, you know, what, I'm sure they could have stopped that. Yeah, and he managed to get through like two weeks in the jungle without saying anything particularly um, yeah. damaging. Yeah. Or Much to Richard's <laughs> disappointment. Yeah. But I mean, he, you know, there's no suggestion that he's betraying confidences, but he's he's sort of like t towed a clever line in that is there's all these affectionate, sweet stories that royal fans will love, but he's not upsetting anyone in the royal family. No, so he sort of talked about picnics in Scotland and this kind of thing, which we do know, you know, we know a bit. I, I think what's interesting, though, is kind of hearing it directly from a member of the family, though, because these things we're used to reading about from royal correspondents or, you know, sort of friends and people, but to actually hear it... Um, yeah, it's, it's well, interesting. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes you do hear from Prince Harry about life in the royal family, but it yeah. sounds sort of like sort of, sort of a contrast. Well, at least he's doing things very differently, yeah. And he's <laughs> always accentuating the positive. Um, so, you know, good, good for him. Yay. We love Mike Tyndall. Well, Richard, just, just quickly for viewers, remind us the name of the book of Mike's that these revelations came from. Well, it's a book to accompany um, his popular um, rugby podcast, which is The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. Um, our viewers might remember the, they, they recorded an episode of the podcast at Windsor Castle with um, Prince William, Catherine, and Princess Anne. That's right. That was a um, that was a very good watch. So it's it's basically a book to sort of go with that. So I think um, readers might find that actually most of it is about rugby. Yeah. Well, you know, but still check that out anyway. Well, a quick look at some royal fashion before we get to your comments. Now we do expect our royal family to wear expensive designer wear, but over the last few years. We've seen them wear so-called high street brands more and more. The Mail and Lives Royals page has pulled together some of the times the royals have dressed elegantly, but for a lot less than you might think. Uh, Natasha, tell us what caught your eye here. Um, well, there are pictures of um, the Princess of Wales wearing the Vega trainers, which we talked about last week when Prince William wore them. So they're obviously a favourite. Charlotte, you said you're a fan. So clearly yeah. you're in line with all the royals. <laughs> um, uh, me and M, which um, the Duchess of Edinburgh has worn, that was a brand and that's kind of very popular, isn't it? Um, and Meghan Markle, dare I say, wearing Monica Vinader, which I'm also a fan of because oh, I'm very wearing good. it right now. So that great British brand. So there we go. There. Yeah. Great jewellery. We love Monica. Yes, uh, me and M is one of those labels that may as well just take any money I earn and just take it without. <laughs> <laughs> having the middle woman of me but, <laughs> so yeah exactly yeah me and M. we love them but you know we we are used to hearing about Catherine's great style aren't we mm -hmm. after all these years but Beatrice has holding her own these days she's becoming more and more of a style icon yes Beatrice just won Tatler's best dressed person I'm not just royal person and I have to say when I first started doing this job I never thought I'd see that day come because she dressed Unfortunately, not very well. It was for a her long fascinator, time. wasn't it? That yeah. she wore I, that's, the, I feel like, you know. The pretzel. The she's famous just pretzel. Yeah. <laughs> haunted by that one hat when yeah. actually she's, she's fine. She always looks great. Yeah, well, she's got Olivia Buckingham as her stylist now, and she's now gone up a level. She, you're right to say the pretzel, it was a bit of a one off, but she never dressed amazingly, whereas now she dresses, she's just amazing. She looks mm. so glamorous. She's found the perfect silhouette for her pig figure. And actually, she was out at Nikki Hilton's dress launch this week. And you can't tell she's pregnant, by the way. She just, she still looks mm. incredibly svelte. She, she looks great. She's in a little black dress. And she's just, yeah, she's really coming into her own, I think. 
We love to hear it. Now, Richard, we don't always uh, drag you into our fashion chats, <laughs> but did anything grab you from this story? I say, I mean, what occurs to me is just it is very difficult how to dress when you're a member of the royal family. You know, do you go sort of upmarket or do you go to sort of high street labels and things? Um, there was one, I've written a piece um, about Megan for Mail Plus today, and actually there was one incident there where she visited a school in Harlem, New York, where um, there were lots of deprived children. I think about 90% were on free school meals. Um, and she turned up in the most expensive um, outfit you can imagine these stilettos and the, ho the whole thing cost thousands mm. and lots of people at the time thought it seemed inappropriate so it kind of it just highlighted for me how difficult it is and how much thought you actually have to put in before an engagement as to what exactly. you wear. Exactly and I, I think you know the thing is like particularly the British High Street we know is brilliant for shopping mm. so it is possible to dress well without dripping in money. They're really good, the royal family, at finding <coughs> Zara jackets that look yeah. like they're Chanel. Yeah. And uh, Beatrice uh, wore one recently that's kind of got round buttons. So you can look, if you are royal, you can look seriously regal in yeah. a high street jacket because you are royal. And you're looking regal in high street today. Oh, thank this you very much. Yes, yes everyone's, you. everyone's doing well. Well, lots more to come on this show, including a fierce article on Megan from a leading editor. Before that, though, let's take a look at a couple of your comments. Now, Carla had this to say about Harry and Meghan buying a house in Europe. Portugal is not for Meghan. Here, nobody cares who she is, no paparazzi. Remember, Madonna lived here and never was photographed because we really don't care. That would be a nightmare to her being completely ignored. Okay, then. Well, we'll have more on that story in just a moment. But after our discussion of Sophie, Duchess of Edinburgh's trip to Africa last week, Jake wrote, it was so nice to hear Richard say what I have been thinking. Sophie's in the mold of the Princess Royal, who are blessed, we are blessed, sorry, to have them both, wonderful ladies. Loads of you wrote in about Prince William's beard. Some of you love it, like Cindy, who wrote in with this helpful maths. Prince William plus beard equals very dashing. Three exclamation marks. And now some of you are more in Camp Sandra, who says, off with his beard. Yes, all of it. William, Prince of Wales, has his entire life to look old. He is the youth and vibrance of the royal family. I hope he will enjoy that while he can. And you were divided about the goatee idea, but some were up for Charlotte's suggestion of a tash like Janie, who says, I actually like the idea of a moustache for William. The beard does make him look a bit unkempt. Well, we'll have to add a new option to that uh, crucial poll. Please keep those comments coming in. We love to read them. <sighs> Enough about beards for one week. Let's get back to the panel. Now, Richard, after your world exclusive last week, world exclusive uh, about Harry and Meghan buying a house in Portugal, your colleague Alison Boshoff went off to find why they might have chosen to buy a place there. How come you didn't get to go to Portugal? <laughs> no, everyone else seems to get the yeah. best jobs. I'm stuck in the office. Um, but no, essentially what was lacking from the story is kind of why. You know, there was suggestions that they um, might have done it um, because they would get um, these visa to travel um, without yes, restrictions this through This golden Europe, visa that we were discussing. This golden visa, yeah. But it, it's not really clear why they decided to buy a place in Portugal. And what Alison was exploring and what she'd heard was that it's about being close to um, Harry's cousin, Princess Eugenie, and her family um, who live in that area already. Oh. And, and in fact, um, Jack Brooksbank, Eugenie's husband, um, works for a developer there, a property developer. And they are um, the, the royals, really, that Harry and Meghan remain close to, perhaps mm. the only ones. So, so Eugenie and Jack live in Portugal? Yes, they split their time right. between London and Portugal, but um, Jack Brooksbank, Eugenie's husband, works for the property developer there. Um, nice and work. Yeah, mm. and you know, Eugenie and Jack have children similar age to Harry and Meghan. We know they're very close. You might remember they featured quite heavily in that Netflix series Harry and Meghan, um, and so that, you know, is between Britain and America, but it's a chance for um, the royal cousins to spend more time together. Yeah, cousins bonding in Portugal, Charlotte, that feels like some sort of neutral ground broker of a deal. What, what's going on? Yeah, you have to ask, why can't they just hang out in London? <laughs> because he is a prince of this 
place where we live and it's not Portugal. So I just think it's very odd. It feels like they want to be in Europe and have a foothold in Europe, but they don't, or at least Meghan perhaps, you know, doesn't want to come actually to the UK. And we know that Harry's very concerned about security over here, mm. but he has travelled to this country many times recently and, and been fine security wise, staying in a hotel. Uh, so it just, it feels a little bit sad to me that they can't just have a lovely house here. Mm, indeed. Well, Natasha, Megan has found herself subject to a very strongly worded broadside from a former editor. What, what can you tell us? Yeah, so Tina Brown, who is the former Vanity Fair editor, she was speaking on a podcast um, about uh, Meghan and Harry and their relationship. And yeah, she was speaking in very strong terms. She said that um, Prince Harry um, has basically just totally followed Meghan Markle around, um, expected that she um, was this kind of guru of Hollywood that would um, save him um, and make him a, a new career and a new country. Um, and that Actually, she has the worst judgment in the world. Um, yeah, pretty. The worst pretty, judgment in the world. Yeah, pretty scathing. Gosh. Um, yeah, and just saying, you know, Harry just shouldn't have shouldn't have followed her blindly. It's interesting, isn't it, Charlotte? I mean, the Sussexes have been more than vocal about feeling hardly done by in the media, but it's, mm. it's hard to imagine anyone being that critical of a working royal, isn't it? I think there's a certain level of deferential behaviour from the tabloid media towards working members of the royal family and they're working so they kind of get a little bit of respect and you treat them, you know, you know they can never complain and never explain so you kind of don't go to town on the royals, you know, and I th just wonder whether Meghan had thought that through when she decided to leave. Um, that yes, she can now be on the other side of the pond saying horrible things about our royal family, but she is now, that has made her completely exposed to really cutting remarks and Tina really laid into her. And that just, that would not have happened if she was, you know, this very weak opening various, um, you know, schools in the UK. People would have respected her for working and not, uh, <laughs> not laid into her quite like Tina did. It's interesting. I mean, Richard, for Mail Plus, you... <laughs> little mischief addict that you are. You've, you've written your 10 moments where Megan slipped up. I don't think we've got time to share the whole 10 here, but what, what are some key ones for you? Oh, well, it's a reflection that Tina Brown might, you know, um, be on safe ground with this one, that I didn't have any trouble coming up with 10. There were, Richard Eden. There were quite a few that I had to, <laughs> had to leave out. But yeah, I mean, you kind of think like, what decisions has she has she made that have been good ones? I would say the the one that benefited her was marrying a member of the royal family. That was very good from her perspective. Um, but since they left, I would say from the start, the judgment was poor. Um, you might remember, how did they leave the royal family? They chose to put out a statement themselves, <coughs> very provocative. And then they had their website, Sussex Royal, where they kind of issued, it was almost like sort of, you know, an announcement like they were dictating to the royal family. And that set everything off on the, the wrong foot. And, and remember, they were banned from using the term royal in their website. Sussex Royal had to be ditched. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the one I would say as well is um, the launch of her company, which we've been on this programme, we've spoken about so many times. This was the launch of her lifestyle brand, American Riviera Orchard. Which she chose to launch with, you know, an Instagram page and a video. When was it? Video. Was it July? It, no, it was it was further back. I think it was back in um, March. Right. Okay. Um, oh, wow. And and there's still no sign of any products being sold or anything. And you can't rush good jam, Richard. <laughs> you can't. I, I know. I mean, sometimes you want to sort of encourage people to talk about a company, you know, maybe like a few weeks before it launches or something. But just to do it months ahead, it makes it sound like there was there was no plan, that it was completely ill thought through. And I'm afraid to say that I did play a role in it because I, <laughs> because I ran the story. I rang them to say I'm going to run this story. They obviously thought we don't want it in the Daily Mail. But also, they the Instagram account has it sort of launched and then it hasn't really been active either. Well, again, you don't. Um, anyone knows you don't launch a sort of social media account and then do nothing. You can, you can, I mean, the arrogance of it, really, just like, here we are, and we're not going to do anything. The whole point of social media is it's social. <laughs> you know, you, you socialise. Do you think there's any link between this and uh, the, the inactivity and the struggles to keep staff? Um, well, I, I think it's been, it's definitely been launched um, before it's ready. Mm. That, I mean, that's kind of self-evident. And I think it's, 
next year, you know, they're talking about when something might happen. But it's, it's things like that that I think, uh, essentially, it's all about impatience. I think Meghan just, remember how wonderful it could have been for Harry and Meghan if they'd been part of the royal family. You know, Queen Elizabeth was giving them roles, wonderful roles that she thought would keep them happy on yeah. the world stage. But no, Meghan just couldn't just stick with it just for a a few years. Mm. It's all about impatience. Well, that article is on Mail Plus if you want to check it out. Well, Megan features in a new episode of Our Richard's show, Reading the Royals. Here he is to explain more. Hi there, Palace viewers. We've been filming new episodes of my show, Reading the Royals, and the first is a fascinating one. I've been going through the fallout between Catherine and Megan, and I'm revisiting some extraordinary pictures and stories from the time. Make sure you check out Reading the Royals on the Daily Mail Royals YouTube channel. Gosh, I remember these photographs from the time and they were shocking. Do you really want me to talk about these ones? You were there and then you were there. Okay, good. Love Magic. Thing, yeah. So check out the new episode of Reading the Royals on the Daily Mail Royals on Monday. Back to my panel. Now, Natasha, you've written an interesting piece for Mail Plus. This one is about how Fergie is changing her digital strategy. I didn't know she had a digital strategy to <laughs> communicate with a younger audience. Yeah, so she's joined TikTok, um, which, you know, a couple of years ago, um, people really thought that was just people in their bedrooms, you know, dancing around, no one important was on it. But now it has one billion users, and a lot of them are young people. And um, I was speaking to Sarah Ferguson's PR, and apparently that's a demographic she's really keen to target. Um, Why? She, um, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, th I think she, <laughs> young, because yeah. young people are great. <laughs> and she just, okay. Why not? Yeah. Appeal to them. Um, but she apparently also took counsel from um, Princess Beatrice and Eugenie. So even though they don't have their own TikTok accounts, they were supportive of her doing it. Um, but interestingly, the rest of the royal family will not be doing that because they are currently following the government advice, which is that because TikTok is still owned by a Chinese company, it's viewed as a security risk to be on there. So yeah, Charles won't be um, dancing around on TikTok anytime soon. Now, as the youngest person on our panel, are you on TikTok? Yes, I am. I am. <laughs> Where can we find you? Uh, well, it's uh, at Natasha underscore Livingston. And it's a lot of royal content. So, you know, if you like that, then check you can that go. out. Yeah. Amazing. Now, I'll tell I, my I, daughters to follow you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's against the law for me to be on TikTok. I'm too, I'm too old. But Charlotte, it's great fun, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard, isn't it, for these really deeply traditional institutions? Because mm. they still have to find ways to engage with and be relevant to younger audiences, don't they? Yeah, and I think this is going to be a challenge for William and Catherine going forward because, of course, they are relatively young for the royal family and William will be king one day. And I think when they released that Instagram video um, where Catherine revealed that she's feeling a lot better and she's recovering from her cancer, it kind of it showed that they were trying to engage in a very different way, but it kind of fell flat with some people. It's a little bit, it was a little bit too... Uh, too close for some people. They didn't want to see that much of the royal family because you kind of want them to be these mysterious figures. So I think social media going forward will be very difficult for them to manage because social media is all about seeing the inner workings of you know people's lives, you know, literally inside their bedrooms. Yeah. So how are the royal family going to maintain that mystique and engage in social media and engage a new younger audience? Because young people aren't necessarily monarchists. You have to sort of woo them over the years, don't you? Yeah. So and it's not just the security risks something like TikTok, is it, Richard? They have to, everything feels like the royals have to tread on eggshells, no matter what platform they use. Yes, but it has to be said, like, you know, Queen Elizabeth <coughs> was always keen to keep up with the latest technology, you know, whether she was sending a tweet or, um, you know, <laughs> posting something on YouTube. They would always have those innovations. But TikTok is, as um, Natasha says, is a very sensitive one because of the, the Chinese aspect. Mm. Um, but I think as long as it's done in a uh, you know, mature way. And, you know, we've got our own great Daily Mail Royals account on TikTok, which, um, you know, I've looked at and it's good. And sometimes you see clips of us on yes, there. Yes, I've been on it. <laughs> you yes. can follow that at Daily Mail Royals, which is all one word. It's got lots of royal videos, the occasional clip of this show. And, uh, yeah, but 
What is Fergie doing on TikTok? Is it like all comedy dancers? What? No, it has been quite serious. Um, so she's kind of been well, filmed. I feel bad about, now. Well, instead yeah. of doing the filming herself, but she's been talking about um, her breast cancer diagnosis course, right. and yeah. how she feels. But also about mental health for Mental Health Day. So, you know, I think she's talking about causes that she thinks are important and she wants to connect with young people around those issues. Um, whether or not she kind of films and posts them herself, I don't know. But uh, yeah, the, generally it's been quite worthy stuff so far. I'm going to try and work out how to use TikTok. I'll check that out. <laughs> now, wait for it. That's right, it's time for the unsung royal hero slot. Back this week, it's the star of the show, Princess Royal Richard. Princess Anne undertook an engagement that might look surprising to an outsider. Yes, I mean, it's not so long ago that she was found unconscious and apparently she'd been kicked in the head by a horse. Well, this week she clearly holds nothing against, um, you know, her four-legged <laughs> friends. And she was back attending um, a show, a performance by the Spanish Riding School, which, despite its name, is based in Vienna, Austria. And it's, it's the world's top horse academy, really. And as you'd imagine, she was enjoying meeting the riders and talking to them about their experience and everything. Yeah, I mean... But no, she loves horses as much as ever. Getting back on the horse, that's where that saying comes from. Mm. You've got to get back on the horse. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it's part of her life and yeah. um, she wouldn't hold it against the horse. I if, love that. If, if that's what happened. <laughs> but <laughs> now, obviously, Natasha, it has been relatively quiet for royals at home because of the tour to Australia, but Anne never one to sit still. Yeah, she was also at Ascot um, on Saturday. She was um, presenting award. Um, I think it was the final day of the racing season, so it's a big day. Um, she was presenting award, which is something um, the late Queen used to do. And she also presented a new trophy, which had the horseshoe from um, one of the late Queen's favourite horses, Emma, which was quite sweet. But as you say, really not put off by horses. She's diving <laughs> into all the engagements. Yeah, I think you can't be royal and not love horses. Catherine doesn't. Really? Yeah. She doesn't like riding. That's I true. think she's allergic to them. There to be fair to her, she was allergic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can't I can't think of an image of her on a horse at all. No, me neither. I, I learned something. Ride though. Pardon? I think her children ride. Yeah. I learn something every time I do this show. It's amazing. <laughs> well, it was an extraordinary few days in Australia for the King and Queen's visit, with so many things going on. You might have missed a few of them, and so here are some of our favourite pictures of the past few days. Some wonderful moments there, making me a bit homesick, actually. Some more to look forward to from the Samoa leg, I'm sure. But a reminder to click here to watch the first Reading the Royals up next, if you missed it before. And there's a new episode coming down the line on Monday. My thanks to Natasha, Charlotte, Richard, and to you for watching. We'll see you next week.